What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Monsters of the Gridiron podcast. Swift here. I'm joined by my guy, Walt, making his first uh, appearance on the show today. Adam Basin, Will Wright, and Samo down low. Walt, go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, you know, you call me Walt. Um, if you want to find me, you can get me on Twitter at uh, CB Sickles. And um, yeah, I'm not even going to bother putting my YouTube channel on here. It's pretty insignificant. So. Uh -huh. Adam, I think everybody knows who Adam is, but Adam, yeah, you want to say hi to everybody. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on Bear Down Sports, uh, my YouTube. Well, don't say that. I've seen some of your YouTube stuff. It's not insignificant, man. You got some good stuff going on. <laughs> Thank it's you. in the works. It's in the works. Yeah. Samo, always good to have you on, my man. Absolutely, absolutely. Shout out to everyone out in the chat. Let's talk some good bears. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was just, I was just getting the link ready. I should probably tweet it out. That's something I don't. I don't do enough, but I'll get that going while we get going. We're just uh, we're just gonna kind of freestyle, chop it up, talking Chicago Bears football today. Uh, Adam, my first question: we got we got the Jared Verse confirmation on the top thirty visit. That's something I talked about a little bit ahead of time. I don't, I don't know if anybody knew this, but I had this out there early. But what are your thoughts on the guys we have scheduled for top thirty visits so far, and where you think we're going with that number nine pick? You point just at me because I've been so vocal on Twitter. So if you introduced me to Twitter, you're to blame for me on Twitter. <laughs> I, you I ruined wish I would have never introduced you to it, man. Twitter is so <laughs> toxic, man. Man, there's so many, there's there's so much to consider at nine. If we're gonna start the show with that, that's the hot topic, man, because there's so many ways to look at it. Cause even even now, this is this is new, uh, even Rome. At nine is no guarantee. I've never said that. Rome is my guarantee, but look at Quentin Johnston last year. So to me, the thing is, you don't even know if you have a home run, even with Rome Odunze, which I think there is 100%, 99, 99% Rome Odunze is going to be a star. But that gap between nine and 75 is what is what kills me because there's so much talent up to 50, up to 75. And then after that, it's kind of well known that this is a draft that kind of falls off. Um but to give to give polls credit, I'll preface that as well. Man, he did a master class this year in extracting value out of his picks when when the draft does drop off. Because getting Ryan Bates, uh, getting Keenan Allen, getting those the value out of those picks when those would have just been prospects that are like the first couple of years where he was drafting and getting Jatari Carter and um, backup centers and backup tackles and players backup safeties. Kendall Williamson that didn't even make the team went to another team and we're picking other players teams players i mean really getting value this year so i'm torn honestly i'm torn i if rome's there i want him but i also want us to trade down i don't know what's right i'm just glad it's in the hands of ryan Poles. that's my answer i i'm just glad it's in his hands and not mine i think that's kind of how i feel right now is you you kind of put it exactly how i feel with pick number nine like if romo dunze is on the board he's probably one of the few guys in the draft, unless Marvin Harrison, of course, but I think that'd be crazy. But if Rome yeah. is there, I think you just take him at nine and say, hey, we got all those extra picks next year. We can either try to use some of that capital to get back into the draft or we just take our four picks this year and see what happens next year with all those extra picks, let guys develop. But Rome's a sure thing, in my opinion. I think he's I think he's miles above Quentin Johnson last year. I did like Quentin Johnson, but I think Odunze is – would have been a surefire top five pick even in last year's draft. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts, Samo or Walt? You guys want to jump in on that pick nine talk and some of these pro days? Why don't you go ahead, Samo? Hey, so for me, I've been thinking about this a lot lately as to who we go with and if it's offensive or defensive. And for me right now, I'm at the point where I just feel like we should draft another defensive player, and specifically on the defensive line, whether it be three tech or edge rusher. Simply because uh, we know the conversation that Luce and Ryan Poles had with everyone and the narrative being with they wanted to pick a player that's going to affect or affect the quarterback. And I feel like we have to get someone who's going to uh, help to affect the quarterback, you know, and, and to another pass rusher. Simply because if Montez Sweat goes down, then our defensive line production dips significantly. And also because uh, we want to allow our strength of our team, which is our defense, to continue to be the strength of our team. And we have an opportunity to build on the strength of our team by adding 
a uh, another pass rusher, whether again be defensive end or three tech. So, and that allows Caleb Williams to kind of tuck the cape in and allow him to just play game manager as, as in a sense, so he doesn't have to feel like he has to be the hero every game. He doesn't have to go out there and throw for 300 yards a game and three touchdowns for us to get a win. Allow our defense to, you know, keep the scores down low and allow Caleb to uh, manage the game, get us up and down the field, and then get us out of some tough situations in two-minute drills, you know, third downs and, uh, and, and so forth. And, you know, that's where we want to see him be special in, in, on those downs. But as far as, you know, as the game goes, I want to take some of that off of him. I feel like if we get another receiver, then the receiver becomes the third or fourth option in this offense this year, simply because of the weapons that we already have. And uh, yeah, that's just where I'm at with it. Uh, I, I've struggled with it going back and forth uh, and, and heard all of the different uh, responses from everyone else and their position on it. And I feel like that's where I am with it right now. Yeah, man, I could see that. I think, that's key. And I think that's kind of been the key of the season as far as what Ryan Poles have been doing is putting this rookie quarterback, Caleb Williams, we all think it's going to be in a position where he doesn't have to do as much as Justin Fields ever had to do when he was here. And that's putting him in a position to succeed, putting him in a position where he can come in here. And the term game manager is thrown out a lot. And I've seen some fans, why did we trade away Justin Fields if we're going to have this dude be a game manager he's generational why are we having to be a game manager but that's not that's not the thing we're not making him a game manager we're making it easier on him to where he can just manage games and make some plays when he's needed and kind of ease into the role of a playmaker in the nfl Mm -hmm. cj stroud kind of did the same thing last year and no one's going to look back at his rookie year seeing he threw four thousand yards and say C.J. Stroud was a game manager, but a lot of times that is what they asked him to do, and you just get a lot of big plays out of that. So there's a little bit of a misconception there with that term game manager, and I just wanted to touch on that a bit. But do you have any thoughts on that, Walt? you want to jump in? You know, I am, Samo, you and I are on the same page in terms of this pick. Uh, I, I will admit I started off the offseason with we have to take a wide receiver at nine. Sure you know, I wanted Marvin Harrison Jr. at one, honestly. But when I sat down and really thought about it, I looked at it as like you said, if we bring in a wide receiver, he's option three, he's option four. I can replace somebody across Montez Sweat and possibly get a guy as a three or four down player who's going to give me more of an impact in terms of the actual game than than a third wide receiver going into next year. So I'm going to start with that. Uh, In terms of defensive position, I'm going to have to go edge. Um, As much as Matt Eberflus wants to do with this big three tech, he can possibly get it somewhere later in the draft. But these big edges, is, we saw it with Montez Sweat. You know, we brought in Yannick Ngakwe. He failed. Um, the three, the defensive tackles outside of really Andrew Billings didn't really get going. They didn't put pressure on the quarterback. What happened when Montez Sweat came into the room? We started getting pressure on the quarterback. He affected everyone else down that line. So to bring in somebody else opposite him, and don't get me wrong, I love DeMarcus Walker. I think he's a fine player. He might benefit being kicked inside more than anything else. But we need somebody else. And like you said, if we remove Montez Sweat, we go back to the same situation we were in before. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Kind of segue there is um, the defensive line. And that's kind of a big touching, a big conversation right now with Bears fans is what's more important, the defensive end or adding more pass rush from the interior of this defensive line, which seems to be what Eberflus prefers. But Walt kind of hit it on the head there. When I look at this draft, I see a lot more depth. I see a lot more depth when I look at the defensive tackle position than I do the defensive end. And then also just in the NFL draft in general, edges are usually acquired early in the draft. Those are first round picks. Those are top top 50, top 25 players, usually top 10 even if you want an awesome edge. So I think it's most likely if we're going to take an edge, we're going to have to take that guy early in the first round. And we could still probably add some help to the interior of this defensive line later in the draft. What are your guys' thoughts on that? No, that makes a lot of sense because uh, when you when you prioritize, I know um, they said Pose is going to break up the room and, you know, scouts for, for the wide receiver, for the offensive tackle, and for the edge. And the way I'm looking at it, and I want Marvin Harrison, I want Malik Neighbors and or Romeo, Rome Adunze, but – 
at the end of the day, man, we're thin at edge. Like, I'm not banking on Yannick and Godway coming back, even if he comes back on a team-friendly deal, being effective. And like I said, if something happened to Montez Sweat, God forbid, now we're left with Demarcus Walker and Dominique Robinson. Like, nah. Like, to me, it's a no-brainer. You know, if, if Dallas Turner – and, you know, I want Jared Burst, but, you know, at this point, I take either one or even Latu uh, – that we trade down and get lot to by acquiring a second round pick, which the wide receiver depth is great. We could pick up an Xavier Leggett, you know, late second, early third, or Malachi Corley. Because when I'm thinking about it, the thing that scares me about the wide receiver side, well, if some Keenan Allen been getting hurt a lot lately. So if he goes down, then we right back, man. I our wide receiver room is is right back where we started. So th those are two positions back to back that I know for sure after the number one pick, we have to figure out a way to infuse some young talent to get into that locker room and start to build because, you know, Keenan Allen, he's really a one year rental at this point, unless he signs an extension. <clears throat> and then the lack of depth at edge, like me, it's a priority that either Dallas Turner, Jared Verse, or, or, or Latu is targeted with that second pick, whether it be at nine or a trade down. That That's where I stand right now because Braxton Jones, he's still serviceable. I think we can still, you know, do pretty well with him. But at this point, based off where we are, needs, you know, because we don't want to put a lot of pressure on uh, on Caleb. So you got to be able to get out of the quarterback and, and attack opposing offenses. I think to me, hands down, edge is, is priority. And one of those three players will be the target. Did you guys see uh, <clears throat> Gervon Dexter's – or not uh, – Montez Dex. Sweat's comment about Gervon Dexter, Big Dex, on Chris Long's podcast? I Talked did. about him even coming from the outside, and that made me look it up. Like, he actually played a ton over tackle, more than I thought. Like, he's very versatile. And that's what I like about some of these guys, like – well, you mentioned it with Demarcus Walker. I, I pointed that out on my show. Like Demarcus Walker played elite level with Montez Sweat here. The problem is, just like you said, Will, if Montez Sweat goes out, we're screwed. Like we are we are in trouble. You saw the way players played without Montez Sweat here. If he's gone, this team is like literally bottom of the barrel for the entire league. So we've got to beef up the defensive end position specifically. I was I was actually impressed of how well Gervon Dexter did, and a guy that I was looking at in the draft that I hadn't put much stock in because the Bears and, and everyone else has. So I'm I'm going to preface that, but the Bears haven't brought him in for a top thirty was Jerzon Newton, and I saw he actually played just as many snaps. He's he's labeled as a defensive interior, but he's played just as many snaps uh, on tackle and outside of tackle, so a, an edge position type of role as he did on the interior. So I'm surprised the Bears haven't brought him in, and maybe they will with one of their final top 30 visits. We've only got a couple days left to do those. But but I agree that, that that defensive position, especially the edge, we don't have a fourth interior. I mean, we've picked up some scraps, but we don't have a fourth interior. We definitely don't have backup edges. That's probably more important than the wide receiver at this position. It's just it's so hard to hit on wide receivers. That's why I've been a big fan of the trade down, that, that small trade down with teams being – Hungry for quarterback right there, 11, 12, and 13. Could we really over oversell and make someone pay to come up with us? That's what I'm in favor of. If we can get a small trade down and just like you said, still get a Latu, uh, Liatu Latu, or still get, uh, heaven forbid, if Dallas Turner was there, great, or Jared Verse, or even Jerzon Newton. I mean, there's so many options there that are stacked guys. I don't know. I'm, I'm just becoming a fan of that small trade down and still getting a defensive player and still picking someone up in the second round. That's that's where I've really become a fan of with where the scenario is. So for me, it's about uh. so I look at all of the different defensive ends and defensive tackles. I agree. And, and, and I definitely agree with Flukes. I think that three tech is the guy who can affect the quarterback the most. However, I don't see a guy that fits his mold or his ideal mold uh, in this draft. Uh, that can just come right in and just, you know, be a game record. I have a butt behind every player, I think, uh, except one. So if you, if I look at layout two a lot too, I love layout two a lot too, but he has the medical concerns. I love uh, Dallas Turner, but he's more outside linebacker than defensive end and really can't set an edge, and I don't like the way he uses his hands. I like Jerzon Newton and Byron Murphy, 
but they don't have the ideal length that Luce covets. And I look at Chop Robinson, but he doesn't have the production in college, of course. The only guy that has the least butts to me is a Jared Verse, man. And I think he's the ideal target right now for the Bears. And I'm happy to see that he's now listed as a 30 player uh, simply because I think he's a plug and play player. And also, I think he's going to be one of those blue chip guys. I think these other guys are kind of hit or miss, you know, based off the size and the arm length, uh, depending on, you know, whether or not they're going to be come in and, and be able to be dominant. I think that verse is one of those guys that's going to come into the building and immediately uh, dominate on, on that side of the field, on that side of the defensive line. And uh, it also – I've been considering the combination of players as opposed to, you know, just the one player. Like if I draft the wide receiver, you know, there are only like three or three, maybe four uh, wide receivers that are going to come in and just be uh, effective early on in the, in the league. That's how I feel about it. So especially given the fact that, you know, we're not asking them to be a uh, number one target. So, uh, and if I draft the interior defensive lineman, you know, we, again, we don't know what we're going to get. So I feel like the combination of a Jared Burst at nine, and if we get back to 75 and we have to go back a little bit, they're going to be more wide receivers there because they're, this class is deep at wide receivers. So maybe we can get a, a uh, Xavier Legat or something if we trade up a little bit and something like that. A Xavier Legat or a Keon Coleman in the second round by trading up or, or do something of that nature. Or even if we don't, you know, there are going to be some other guys there that I think are worthy of the pick there, or we can get an offensive tackle in a Q Kiran, uh, a mega DG or something like that. I think the combination of players is what we have to consider because we can also get a defensive tackle later in the draft in a Mason Smith or something like that. So that's just how I've been looking at it lately. Just thinking about the combination of players. So if we can trade back a little bit, and pick up maybe a second round pick and, and still guarantee that we're going to get Jared verse. And that's the route I would go. If it's the second or third round pick where we can trade back up or, you know, get some, uh, gain some capital and give us a little bit more wiggle room so that we can target guys and make sure that we're getting a good wide receiver. We're getting a, we have a great, at that point, we have a great wide receiver, excuse me, a great quarterback and a great edge rusher, you know, two players who, or multipliers, force multipliers on the offensive side and the defensive side. So I think that's what's important and, you know, just moving from there and trying to build the best team of of, of uh, draft picks as opposed to just thinking about it as one player. You know, I'm trying to look ahead and see, like, who's available at what position. We know what position, the positions of need are, you know, and see, you know, how much talent is left at this position and, what opportunities do I have to get some of these other guys as opposed to just thinking about the one player, uh, thinking about the group of players a little bit? Well, the thing is, when you listen to fans even talk about what you just said with the defensive ends, I think it's pretty clear everyone wants at least a new edge somewhere because we don't have any depth there. And that's really at the top of the draft. When you talk about those top four with Dallas Turner, Leatu Latu, Jared Verse, and Chop Robinson, um, <clears throat> outside of Chop Robinson, those top three are kind of, consensus considered top 20 chop robinson's right there as well all four of those and then you add in there a couple of the defensive tackles that could go in the first round i mean are we really going to be upset with any one of those five or six players if we do trade back a little bit and still get one of them i mean that's that's my question because people can't even agree if, if dallas turner or Leatu latu or jared verse is their favorite so if we trade down to 13 or 14 or 17 or 18 and we still get one of those guys. Is anybody really going to be upset about that come draft night? I'm, I'm genuinely curious if we're going to be upset if we get one of those guys and trade it down. I don't think so. I don't think anyone would be upset about it at all. But I don't think anyone would ever be upset about, you know, as long as we get the position and we get one of those guys, I think we're good. I think once we fall beyond those guys, anything beyond a Chop Robinson is, you know, that's a, a dart in the wind. We don't know. If a Chris Braswell is going to be a, a great player, I, even though I love, I think I think he's a good player, and I also like uh, Adiza Isaac a lot. But those guys both have question marks, those butts about their game, and you know, so I would rather have someone uh, with the ninth pick 
us having a ninth pick that going to be a plug and play guy. Even if we decide to trade back a little bit, we need a guy that's going to be able to plug and play uh, three, four downs. You know. Well, it is. It's telling what Ryan Poles has done with his top thirty. Now we know that they don't always draft their top thirty visits. Sometimes it's smokescreen. I think more often it's you bring these guys in, you really vet them, and sometimes other people draft your guy ahead of where you would have drafted them. But they've brought in all four of those edges now. And then there's a lot of players in that early second round range that they've brought in. So they clearly have it on their mind that they could do what we're talking about. It's not just hypothetical. Like, really, they are thinking about it. Otherwise, it would only be looking at these guys right here at nine and they'd bring in the top 15 people of the draft and just vet every single one of them and nobody else and nobody in the second round and maybe some late round guys for undrafted free agents and maybe some guys between 75 and 100. But they brought in a significant amount of people that fall right between 20 and 45 from Vlad McConkey to Xavier Worthy and Zach Frazier. I mean, just all sorts of players, different positions too, that fit right in there. So they're clearly analyzing this. And uh, I don't remember who it was that just had it. It might've been Courtney Cronin where she said, where she said, even teams don't know what they're doing right now. This is what this period is right now, where they're going through this analysis phase to make sure all the options are open to them. So they have it all available when draft night hits, and then they're then they're ready for whatever turns transpire. And you'll see on the screen here, there are a lot of guys who potentially, obviously, are nowhere near our range of going in the top nine, like Xavier Worthy, Zach Frazier, Graham Barton, Tyler Guyton. Um, those are day two guys. Same with Chop Robinson, late first round guy. Um, Jared Verse has also been added to this list. But there's a lot of guys here who, like Adam was saying, are guys who could be there on day two mm -hmm. to where it looks like we could be trading down and acquiring another pick or even moving up from 75. That's another option that's not talked about either. But there is potential there, so I like that. Mm -hmm. What does it take to move up from 75? What would that take? How far? Yeah, and, and how far would you be willing to move? And, and which of those players would you be willing to move up for? You know, for Ben if, Sennett, I would take 75 in a second, and I'd trade up for Ben Sennett in the, in the 40s and 50s. I'd do that for sure. I like I like Karen Omega DJ, the I offensive do. tackle. Yeah. And he really should go like, in the 50s or 60s. I would do that too. I probably wouldn't. I mean, the guy that I really think could fall that I would trade up for would be <laughs> Zach Frazier. If, if Zach Frazier's are there around between 45 and 50, if he mm -hmm. falls even below that, like I would be making calls, like especially if we got a pick in the 60s or another third <clears throat> round or even. You watched that Texas game too, huh? Man, I've seen all his games, man. <laughs> that Texas <laughs> game sold me, man. He was handling those big guys up in the middle. And you know what? Well, he doesn't allow it. Coleman Shelton signed on a one year deal, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So yeah, it makes really sense for us to go out to someone like a Zach Frazier, bring him in, you know, let him get a year on his belt. Uh, so by year two, you get him flexibility if they want to extend Coleman Shelton or slide um, Zach Frazier in to be the starting center, you know, after a year of uh, NFL experience. So, you know, I, 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 even though we're limited this year, and then y'all got to think about something too, gentlemen, next year, uh, I, I really see one of those second round picks coming into play for this year, um, whether it's moving up from 75 up into the second round or, you know, at a package deal, because as we're looking, if, if we go edge with that second pick, I can assure you that third pick will be a wide receiver. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And that's, you know, Unless wide receivers start falling and, you know, that they're really yes, looking they to move on from uh, from Braxton Jones and Kieran is there. Because I think Kieran is a good guy to, to challenge Braxton for that position, man, for the left tackle position. And uh, I think I talked to was Adam Mason on another show about this the other day. And Braxton is one of those polarizing players. Uh, for Bears fans, man, who we half of the fan base loves him and the other half hates him and thinks that he, it's time for him to go. So I do want to get some good competition for him, and I think Karen would be the perfect competition there for him. Uh, and I, I, I originally didn't even think that the Bears wanted to would think even consider drafting a uh, 
left tackle so high in the draft, but obviously Shane Waldron and the other guys have come in and convinced Ryan Poles, who, you know, seemingly believed that, you know, he had his left tackle uh, a little bit differently and they want to create some competition there. Well, I, I don't know if it means that he doesn't think he has his, his left tackle because when Poles made his comments at the combine, he was talking about uh, this is a deep offensive tackle class. He wasn't even talking about taking one early. And some fans were were pointing out earlier, you know, we've got we've got our offense set, we've got our defense, we've got we really got all our starters. The problem with this team isn't the starters. The problem that killed us last year was the depth. Ooh. And I was pointing out the other day that Larry Borum took 411 snaps as a swing tackle. So coming in, filling in, that's a lot of snaps. And that is painful for Bears fans because he graded out, I think, as the 119th out of 118th tackle that qualified. I mean, he was just terrible. And sometimes I'm too hard on some of these players. But but honestly, I, I would like to see Larry Borum off the team. And the only way that happens is by bringing in that type of depth, bringing someone that we draft in the third round. Like a Kieran Abujabi, and I don't, I don't know if I'm saying his last name right. That's how I keep saying it. But bringing him in, that at least competes with Braxton. And I don't think he would take Braxton's job year one. But it, he's a quality guy that if you get Braxton in or you have Darnell right shoulder get hurt or his arm get hurt, I mean Darnell would do an amazing job of, of fending off Max Crosby with one arm in the Raiders game. But still, to have someone like Kieran come in and not have to rely on Larry. Borum, I mean, that's a huge upgrade for us. But with what Will was saying about Zach Frazier, I love that because you guys saw, I don't know if everybody remembers, sometimes we have short sight, but last draft, everyone was talking about John Michael Schmitz. We got to go get John Michael Schmitz. We got to draft him. We got to get him. How he did in, in New York, it, does, it doesn't mean he's a terrible player. He might be great year two, but out of qualifying centers, he graded 36 out of 36 qualifying centers, dead last in the league doesn't mean he's a terrible player. He was obviously highly touted last year, but being able to bring Zach Frazier in to sit behind Coleman Shelton. And I see a couple comments about Bates. I don't see Bates as the starter. I, I see him as replacing Jatari Carter. You guys might disagree, but that's what I think Bates was brought in for emergency center type of situation, just like Cody Whitehair. Either way, we've picked up some, so we picked up pieces that aren't starter. These guys aren't starters just because we signed someone. We're going to have 90 players. By the time we we are in camp, that doesn't mean every signing we do means it's the savior of this team. Ryan Bates is better than a six round pick in this draft, but that doesn't mean he's going to be the best player on our team. So if we can pick up a Zach Frazier and have him learn behind Coleman Shelton for a year, not have to be thrust in like John Michael Schmitz was, that's huge, especially that center position where you need to gel, get some work with the quarterback, be able to get that that down and be able to understand transitioning to an NFL level where you're where you're fending off defensive tackles that are NFL level defensive tackles every game getting that heavy pass rush right up the middle that would be huge for someone like Zach Frazier I'm, I'm a huge fan of that if we do that yeah I think you were just wrong just off on the name instead of Jatiree Carter he's replacing Lucas Patrick he's what Lucas Patrick was meant to be when he brought here a guy who can play center or guard and last year that's what he was supposed to be remember uh, Cody Whitehair was supposed to be the starting center and Lucas Patrick was kind of that guy who could back up either guard position or center. That's what Ryan Bates is going to be this year. In my opinion, he can play either guard spot or center if someone gets hurt. But he's definitely an upgrade from last year. So, I mean, it's good that we yeah. got the depth. So it's, it's good that we got that, but I don't see him as being the solution at center. At least Coleman Shelton was, you know, a, a middle of the pack qualifying starting center last year. So I really see Coleman Shelton coming in on that one year. Maybe train up someone like Zach Frazier. The ideal. Yeah, I mean, I, I really don't see Cole Michelle as being that bad. Like you said, he was middle of the road, but he does bring us playoff experience too into the lineup that we didn't really have. So and he, did, you know, some did, he super, uh, did he win no, a Super Bowl? He came Bowl in, with them. He, he came, came in the year after the Super Bowl. So I think he got hurt. Um, he got hurt that year too, I believe, or the year before. So. There is some injury concern. I forget what it was. I think it was his ACL. Those big boys. That's the Connor Williams injury. Those big boys. That's scary. I, I'm no, still he curious did about win that the Super Bowl. Uh, he did win the Super Bowl with them, but he wasn't the starting center for the Super Bowl. Okay. That's what was. I'm going to be honest. I don't even see Larry Bourne making the roster. I don't, I don't, I don't, see, Travis, I don't see Travis Homer making a roster. 
Well, well, EQ, of course, he didn't get re-signed, so he's in New Orleans now. It was one more player that I see that I just don't see, and I think he's restricted. I, I just don't see them even being retained, and I think that should free up about another $10 million for us. So I'm waiting to see what we're going to be able to get off those post-June 1st cuts. And I'm also, uh, you know, waiting to see if we make I, – I still feel there's one more move that's going to be made. I can't pinpoint what it is, but just from analyzing, when you're looking at these other teams like that are overstocked, like look at the Jets, for instance. They just brought in Hassan Reddick. Like their line, edge, is overstocked. You know, it's it, it, it's it's going – and I know they lost um, Bryce Huff, but they were already overstocked when he was there. So you replace Bryce Huff with Hassan, Hassan Reddick, so that means somebody's expendable on that Jets line. So I feel a I feel a trade coming. That, that that's that's another area where I think that we might address some defensive line depth is through via trade. And um, also, like I said, I see us picking up some quality, a Christian Mahogany or Zach Frazier in the draft to be groomed behind Colvin Shelton and to be deaf pieces behind Nate Davis and Tevin Jenkins because. With those guys, when they're on the field, well, Tevin anyway, when he's on the field, he's a monster, but it's keeping him on the field. You know, like I, like 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 the saying goes, you can't make the you can't make the club from the tub. And our interior offensive line depth the last two, three years, I don't care who we got at the skill set position, wide receiver, tight end, running back. If we can't keep that interior healthy, it's a wrap. Nice. And then we got a couple questions from chat that I wanted to get to before we uh, move past them. Uh, first, from Bear Truth 9, how far do you guys think we can drop and still get one of the top wide receiver or defensive linemen? Um, I'll, I'll go first. I think wide receiver, you can't, you can't drop at all if you're getting one of the top three, but you can drop as far as you want and still get a really good wide receiver. As far as D-line, if you're only talking about Jared Verse and Dallas Turner, you can't drop far, probably 12 to 15. You guys go ahead with your thoughts on that. Yeah, I was going to say the top out of 16 on defensive line, I and mean, that's including Latu. But, uh, you know, like you said, with the wide receiver, he, they may not even make it to nine at this point. I think it's the same on both. I think a lot of people are still overlooking Brian Thomas Jr. I still have him categorized in there with my top wide receivers. But I think if he makes it to 15, there's no way the Colts let him go past. So, same range. I think 14 is the farthest you can go down. Even 14, the Saints would take a defensive end if one of those top guys are there. So I, I say it's a small trade down. You're really targeting those quarterback-hungry teams. You're you're targeting those guys fighting over each other. That's why I think the Raiders are the prime trade candidate. Uh, 11, 12, and 13 all want a quarterback. And it really, it, it leaves, if one of those guys trade above us, that leaves one of the better players left for us to, to draft too. So I mean, we're really in a good position at nine, but I think the same range, 12, 13, 14 is where I'd like to see the ideal trade if we still want to get our blue chip guy that we really, really like. Yeah, I agree with you there, Adam. I would allow uh, Denver and Las Vegas to battle it out for that ninth pick and allow one of them to come up and uh, get their quarterback first, you know, uh, from us in a trade to ensure that we get uh, a quality player. Uh, one of those quality defensive ends at that position uh, in at 12 or 13 in the draft. And then it allows us to, you know, pick up a second round pick possibly and draft an Xavier Legat or a uh, Keon Coleman, someone of that caliber uh, later in the draft. And I think that combination of players just stands out to me. Well, I'm going to be, look, I'm going to throw a monkey wrench. And I know we've been hearing it as far as trading up, but if Minnesota comes up to four, and makes that trade with Arizona, which to me, I really think is unlikely. But let's just say for shits and giggles, because they want J.J. McCarthy, because they miss out on Drake May, Jane Daniels, and, uh, uh, and of course, Caleb. Then that puts the Chargers on at five. Well, the Chargers don't have any wide receivers other than hot butter hands, Quentin Johnson. Mm -hmm. And then you go down to number six. The Giants are in a precarious situation. I would say they need a wide receiver. You go down to seven, the Titans, they need a lineman to, uh, you know, give Will Levis some support. And I think the Falcons go Dallas Turner. Uh, 
that that's the that's the that's the primary now I've been hearing as far as edge. So here's the thing: if if you got Marvin Harrison on the board at five, do we come up and try to strike a deal with the Chargers? Something similar to what happened when the Texans came up and got C.J. Stroud and Will Anderson Jr. Like, do we come up and make a play like that? Or, or do – me personally, I would trade down. But in that what-if scenario, if you got Marvin Harrison Jr., a true generational talent now, sitting there waiting at five, and, 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 and Jim Harbaugh wants to do business, do we execute that move? I don't think Harbaugh would. I mean, they just got rid of Keenan Allen. If I and think about it, if you're the Bears and you've got your franchise quarterback and Justin Herbert, and you don't have receivers anymore, and you're sitting at five, why would you trade away Marvin Harrison Jr.? I mean, I, I wouldn't. If I'm Chargers, I'm taking Marvin Harrison Jr. at all costs. If that's the scenario that falls into our laps, yeah, I but, think that'd be a no yeah. If we could trade up, if we could allow them to have us trade up for for minimal, that's the issue though. From nine to five, people think it's your straight across trade value chart. You're not getting straight value at nine to five. You're you're overpaying to go from nine to five and get Marvin Harrison Jr. You're giving up potentially even next year's first to do that. And so you it's, nailed it right there. And that, I think that's the point is if Minnesota trades up, they're hitting either the Arizona Cardinals or the Chargers, and they're overpaying. They're giving a first round pick. We're not. We're not giving up a first round pick to move up. So I think I think that's off the table. If if the Cardinals or Chargers, only one of those two teams are trading out. One of them's taking Marvin Harrison Jr. One of them is one of them can trade out and get a haul, but I don't think there's any chance both of them trade out, in my opinion. There's no way okay, to on the trade now, man. Harbaugh has watched Marvin Harrison Jr. mature in the Big Ten for the past four years, what mm. three, four years. So he knows what that guy is uh, better than any of us probably, and he's not going to allow that guy to get past the fifth pick, especially uh, knowing that his team is deficient in, in that at wide receiver. So I just don't see that happening. On that, on that same yeah. scenario, you saw, the, you saw the Bears trade from 20 to 11 and give up a future first to come up and, and get Justin Fields. If a team that's right out of the range we're talking about, we all want to go between 11 and 13, maybe 14 at most, and still get our blue chip guy. If a team's sitting there, say the Eagles at 22, and they're willing to give up a future first plus their second this year to come from 22 to nine, are we doing that? That's a lot. I would. I mean, it's a lot Ooh. to consider, a lot to think about, because then we've got it, two firsts and two seconds. Right. It is. And, and, and like um, like uh, mm -hmm. Sam said earlier, now, okay, now you go to that second tier pass rush, the Chris Bradwell. Uh, because if we do a trade like that, Adam, then Brian Thomas should be there at 22. Yeah. Uh, so, or Jerzon Newton. Or, I mean, there's still a lot of quality guys Mitchell, there at 20. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, uh, Donnie, uh, Donnie Mitchell, Xavier Ward, all of them should be there at 22. Yep. yep. So we can knock out two birds with one stone if that's the case. We already know that more than likely uh, Denver, Las Vegas, they're going to want to trade up. And I'm hearing the Eagles might want to trade. So it's funny you said that, that they might want to trade up. And I'm like, why would they want to trade up? Well, but if we get that, I mean, say we get that from the Eagles. Say we get, I mean, that's a long way from 22 to nine. It would take their first this year, their second this year, a first next year. If they did that, we could pick at 22 and we could still use our own first. We're not going to trade away their first. We could, I mean, we could trade away one of those first to come up all the way up to the end of the first round, beginning of the second round, and and we can pick another player. I mean, it's this time of year is so crazy. We got 12 days <laughs> to get this settled, guys. We got 12 wow. days yeah. for this thing. And My man Creighton knows? had a question here, though, that we got to address. Does anyone else – he says he knows he smokes a lot, but is anyone else getting a Ghostbuster vibe from Will? Dun -dun 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 -dun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello. Man, I had to get that Excellent. one out before we forgot. All right, we'll go on to the next question then. Did Malik Neighbors say something about wanting to play in Chicago? I don't think I know I heard him say he'd love no. to play with Caleb Williams. He's friends with Caleb Williams. Did you guys hear anything about this? I, I did see this quote they're talking about. I'm gonna try and find it real quick. Okay. 
Yeah, I did see that Romo Dunze said his favorite player is Devin Hester, and he would be honored to play for the – like he was gushing about the Bears saying he'd be honored to play here. Yeah, he did. And Malik Neighbors did is uh, really close with Caleb Williams. He said they talk a lot, played a game together or something, and that uh, Caleb is always complimenting them, telling them how good he is. Which he is, man. That's my favorite. He's my favorite wide receiver in this draft, to be honest with you guys. I know everyone gushes over Marvin Harrison Jr., but what Malik Neighbors can do with the ball in his hands on short routes and, you know, running the ball like a running back is just special to me. And I think that's what the NFL is right now. Guys that can get open quickly, you get the ball to them like uh, like a point guard, short sort of say, and just allow that guy to do all the work. And he's one of those workers, man. I would love to have him. I think that's one of those guys you wouldn't be able to pass on with the ninth pick. And I think uh, I'm going to as well, man. Like, if, if we think about it, if either of those top three receivers are there, do we really think the Bears are going to pass up on those guys? Do you guys really feel like the Bears would just say, uh, yeah, we're going to pass up with, on these guys and, and take the trade back? Or do you are those guys that you cannot pass up on? I mean, personal bias, I'd say they probably would. But looking at it, if you bring in a guy like Malik Neighbors, very talented player, but he also brings in the mental aspect to help ease Caleb Williams into a transition from college to the NFL. Same thing with a guy like Brendan Rice or even uh, Taj Washington. So something to look at. And most people just kind of gloss over that fact that purely at stats. Something to think about. All right, next question we had. This was from Bob Killen. Has anyone heard that Connor Williams might retire due to his last injury? I definitely haven't heard this. I think he's probably just waiting till he's able to pass a physical. There was an article there, from the, the no. Dolphins early, early on, like when he first got injured, but I haven't heard it since he started his rehab. He sounds pretty motivated at this point to try to return, but I don't think anybody's even considering signing him until he, he gets healthy. But, yeah. yeah, there was an initial rumor when he first got injured. That was in the season last year. I heard that one, but I haven't heard it since. Fair no, is that what you were going to say? Yeah, exactly. I think it was, uh, it was Finn Haven, or Finn Heaven was the uh, article you were talking about. At least that's where I saw it. But, I mean, it really depends on how his surgery went, who his surgeon was, and what his off-season rehab team is looking like. Because that could either increase or decrease the time he needs to rehab that injury. And it really depends on where it was, too, because this is his second ACL injury. Correct. Oh, really? Those big boys can struggle to heal yeah. with those. That's scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And then I think it comes down to, man, it's we're one injury away at three different positions: that offensive tackle, wide receiver, or defensive end. We need depth at all three of those positions. So or three tech, three tech as well. Yeah, I mean. If, if, if Javon Dexter goes down, what do we really have there? I mean, Zach Pickens is going to be your only guy. You're going to count on him to be a starter when you rotate. I mean, so that's not – we need depth at all those positions. But wide receiver, the same. If we lose DJ or Keenan Allen, we're right back to where we were last year where, yeah, it was nice having DJ more, but we had nothing else on the offense. And if they took him away, our offense struggled. So – we need help at multiple positions. That's one of the reasons I'm such a big fan of a trade down. At least a couple picks, unless Romo Dunze is on the board. I think he's the only guy at nine. I think even Malik Neighbors, who I think is more likely to be there, I would probably try to entice a team to overpay and come up for Malik Neighbors or one of the quarterbacks if there's somebody there, instead of even then just taking him. Even then, what you just said, if Malik Neighbors or Romo Dunze are there, the, the value just went up. Someone's going to pay more to come up and get him. Maybe the Colts are, are going to pay to come up and get him. Maybe the Bengals at 28. We don't want to drop that far, but if the Bengals give They're a at 18, haul. Okay. Or at 18, sorry. Who yeah. is at 28? The Bills. The Bills were at 28. Yeah. That year. The rumors about them needing a wide receiver, too. I mean, but I'm honest, anything's possible. Bulls. With Rome, is scary because at the end of the day, look, if, if Arizona doesn't trade out of their fourth spot, which more than likely they won't because they don't have any wide receivers, they're taking Marv. Let's, let's, let's just be honest. Yeah. And then if the Chargers don't trade out, they're taking Malik Neighbors. If the Giants don't trade out, 
because they they can't come up and get one of those top three quarterbacks. More than likely, they take in wrong. The the top that'll be back to back to back because all three of those guys they need wide receivers. They do at the yeah, end of the day. Sorry, and, and to the me, Giants. the X factor would be the Chargers, which again, realistically, the Chargers don't need to trade out because they got the fourth and 27th pick in the first round, along with like 10, 11 other picks. So they playing with house money at the end of the day. You know, so I'm praying the Chargers say, you know what? Instead of a wide receiver, we'll go select tight end, University of Georgia. <laughs> that's what I'm hoping. But more than likely, that's not going to happen. I don't want that, man. Mm-mm. I mean, the, the, the Giants are a big question mark for me because they have Andrew Thomas at left tackle, but their right tackle situation has been in flux ever since drafting Evan Neal. He just hasn't panned out at this point. So they can do thank they the have that, for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do they have that conversation in house that maybe we pass over a wide receiver and take a, a tackle instead? Because we saw that problem all year last year with them. And it'll work to our benefit, hopefully. Yeah, or wide receiver. I mean, everyone talks about Daniel Jones like he's not going to be the quarterback next year. But of the teams that are talked about taking quarterback, I think the Giants are less likely to take a quarterback in the first round than anybody else is talking about. I can see him taking a second or third round quarterback. If Bo Nix is there in the second round or Michael Penix is there in the second round, I can see them absolutely taking there. But I don't see the Giants with their needs. And that's why they even said that the Patriots might not even – if there's one prime trade candidate, if I'm the Patriots – and Minnesota's willing to trade up, and Arizona won't, and they want to go to three, and they're willing to give up 11, 23, and more. If I'm the Patriots, they have so many needs. Them bringing a quarterback in is like when the Bears brought in Justin Fields. They're bringing someone in that's going to definitely fail the first year. I mean, might not whole career fail, but not a prime situation for a quarterback to come into. So picking a quarterback at 11 – instead of three and I'm the Patriots and I'm getting more picks, I would be trading down if I'm the Patriots, but I don't know. If that's I just don't think they take, do it just, because what they went yeah. through with Tom Brady, like there's that whole, there was the whole and Tom new Brady coaching thing. staff. You always yeah. want to, you always want to pick a quarterback with a new staff and the new regime. Well, and they and chose going on. There was kind of a, it was kind of like a quarterback versus coach debate there, right? You had Belichick yeah. and you had Brady and he chose, he went with Belichick and said, all right, I'm choosing you. I think it's the coach. So, and then the quarterback goes and wins the Super Bowl, and you don't win anything with Belichick after Brady leaves. I think Robert Kraft has a new mindset that we got to get that quarterback and being in a position to get a top three guy. I don't see the Patriots trading out of it. I think it's something that's overlooked. People, I know they have a lot of needs, but I think Robert Kraft wants that quarterback. So I think. I think the Vikings' best chance is going to come. It's between the Chargers or Cardinals, and I think the Cardinals are going to—they're going to do the same thing. They're going to say, unless you're giving us three first-round picks, we're going to sit right here and take the best player in the draft at pick four and get Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah, because like you said, so I don't think Kraft wants to get burnt again with that decision at quarterback. There's too much riding on that at this point. But if they really he- analyze it, if you sit down and look at it, I did a video on that with Mac Jones versus Justin Fields. Mac Jones played awesome his first year, declined second year, declined third year. What was the difference? Their line kept declining. Their team kept declining. They kept getting rid of their wide receivers. Like the entire team around Mac Jones. Now, I'm not saying Mac Jones is some wonderful savior quarterback, but they let the entire team decline, and now they're not in a position. Are they going to repeat the same thing? This isn't a Patriots podcast, but, man, if I'm then, I've really got to consider where our biggest needs are. So I don't know. And I think with the Giants, I think the Giants could take a quarterback too. I know, I know, I know they got to pay Daniel Jones, but I think it comes down to what happens with JJ McCarthy. If JJ McCarthy is still on the board at pick six and the Vikings weren't able, say that say the top three quarterbacks go one, two, three, like everyone expects, and the Cardinals take Marv at four, and then the Chargers are sitting there and the Vikings are offering them two first, but Jim Harbaugh's like, I'm just going to take Joe Alt. And he takes Joe Alt, and then suddenly the Giants have a chance sitting there at six. Yeah, they love Romo Dunze, but I think everyone knows Daniel Jones isn't the long-term answer, no matter what they have to pay him this year. And I think it wouldn't be hard to argue with anyone that J.J. McCarthy would definitely benefit from setting for a year. 
he didn't get enough experience throwing the ball in, in college. They ran a ton. So I think they could definitely take J.J. McCarthy there. And if you're the Giants, you're missing Romo Dunze. And yeah, you need wide receivers, but you can still get a stud receiver in the second round. You can land an Xavier Leggett or somebody like that. So I wouldn't overlook that. And I think that's why the Vikings are trying to get ahead of the Giants and why they're stockpiling this ammunition. But if JJ's gone, yeah, I don't I don't see them reaching and taking Bo Nix or anything. I don't know if anybody will, though. As I look at the top six picks, I don't know if anybody's going to trade out of those top six picks. Genuinely, I think they I think it's going to go. Now, what I would do and what I think is going to happen is different, but I really think it's going to go quarterback, 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 wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver. I think that's I think it's going to go chalk just like that. And then you've got Joe Alt going seven and then Dallas Turner going eight. And then here we are at nine. That's that's just what I think, but I don't know. I think I think once you get to pick six there with the Giants, if it goes like you said, then they would have a choice of one of the receivers, either Odunze or Neighbors, as well as Joe Alt or JJ McCarthy. And I think they would probably lean towards JJ McCarthy or Joe Alt over taking a receiver right there, just simply due to the fact the talent at wide receiver in this draft. And they have a high second round pick. You can still get a stud wide. You can possibly <clears throat> land Keon Coleman, Lad McConkey, Ricky Pearsall, Xavier Leggett. So they can still get help at wide receiver. And they just drafted uh, Jalen Hyatt, Hyatt last year. They have Darius Slayton and they have Wandell Robinson. So if yeah, but the none Chargers of those guys are like more doing today, I wouldn't even neighbors didn't even that much of a fit. Do you want another six foot or under guy? If it's neighbors, I can see what you're saying. But if Odunze is there, how do they pass on that when they've struggled so hard at wide receiver? And they, yeah, you're taking those prospects you're talking about from last year with them, but they haven't got a home run and they've struggled at wide receiver. So I don't know. I'm glad I'm not in the Giants. <laughs> but, but I mean, quarterback, how quarterback, we already know. We already know quarterback is the big needle mover. And when it comes to the Giants and what they're paying Daniel Jones, they're paying him one more year. And then they're able to get out of it after this year. So, and they're picking six overall in a really talented quarterback class. If it falls the way and JJ McCarthy is there, and the Vi- we are everyone knows the Vikings desperately want him, I definitely would not rule out the uh, Giants taking JJ McCarthy, setting him behind Daniel Jones for a year, and then adding a receiver later in the draft, maybe even two of them. Because there's no guarantee Daniel Jones is even going to make half a year at this point. That too. Yeah, yeah, you have to look at that. I mean, honestly, the only picks that I see are locked in right now are one through four. After that, it's crapshoot. And you know, something else we got to think about, guys, whoever we pick at wide receiver, which I do think a possible trade down from nine will take place. Wide receiver three gonna have to have the ability to return punts because it's not gonna be another situation where you're gonna have a whole roster spot dedicated to someone like Trent Taylor that's just coming in to secure point punts. And I know two or three wide receivers that can do that. Keon Coleman, Xavier Worthy, and Xavier Leggett. So I don't Malik see Washington. Malik Washington. Washington. And, and, and Malik Washington. Malachi Corley. And, Todd and, Washington. And Todd, I, I like those. I like those running back style quarter or wide receivers like Xavier Leggett that you just mentioned, or even they're not overlooking him, I hope, because him in this new kickoff system would be pretty cool to watch him. With his running back style of running, be able to break through a line, nobody be able to hip drop tackle him, and he could be taken off for some touchdowns this year. This could be fun to watch. But Adam, yeah. you say a kickoff. We're talking punt returns. I feel Correct. like that's why they brought I, Dante I, Pettis, I Pettis back, back, honestly. That's Pettis, yeah. For punt for so. punt returns, yeah. But I mean, we if we get someone to beat him out, obviously if we could get a key on Coleman, like Will mentioned there, someone like that, I think it'd be perfect. He'd be our punt returner. Um, but Pettis is that guy right now, but if we can beat Pettis out and get Pettis off the roster, but right now Dante Pettis is probably our wide receiver three. I think he's probably, if the season started today, do you guys think he'd be ahead of Tyler Scott and Valus Jones? I I kind of think so. Yeah, depends on camp, man. Not, not yeah, because I mean, no, be, just because it's a camp. sophomore year for Tyler Scott. I think he still has right, that third spot. Right. They're still working right. with him. They're still yeah. working with him, and even with Valus, he he was a what third round pick. So I, I'm still looking at where those guys were drafted, and those are two of Ryan Pohl's uh, Pohl's guys. I, that in itself gives them 
some form of legitimacy and, and weight over Dante Pettis. But if we were ranking based off experience and skill set, I would say he's a wide receiver three because he would be someone I would trust and rely on on, on money third down versus a Tyler Scott or a Bayless Jones. Well, I think Tyler Scott has that potential. I like Tyler Scott's game, but I think his production last year was awful. He dropped more yardage than he caught. So I think I wouldn't just hand him the wide receiver three job. Pettis has been more productive in the NFL. So heading into camp, I would probably, if season started right now, I'd say Pettis is that three guy and Scott or Valus, you got to beat him out to get that job, which yeah. not that hard. If you can't beat out uh, Dante Pettis, then you shouldn't be our wide receiver three anyway. So, but that takes us, uh, Levante asked a great question here um, that, fed into Adam's point. Is there a possibility the Bears can swindle the Vikings if JJ is still there? So let's say the um, it, Adam's right here and it goes like he did three quarterbacks, three receivers, and then that would put it pick seven. The Titans would probably take Joe Alt and then the Falcons if they took um, Dallas Turner. We're sitting there at nine then and obviously we've let it known we might be taking calls. All the receivers are off the board. The tackle, Joe Alt's gone. So we're taking calls, the Vikings or Raiders, and we're like, hey, Minnesota, you better you better overpay us right now. Or guess what? JJ is heading to Denver or Las Vegas, wherever we decide. So yeah, I think that's uh that's what that's why we're so excited about this draft. If there are possibilities like that, and nobody knows a hundred percent what's gonna happen, but if the draft did fall that way. I think it's no secret that a few of those teams would be interested in coming up for J.J. McCarthy. So, yeah, I think our phone would be ringing off the hook at that point. What's your guys' take on this? Just make Absolutely. Smile. Yeah, that that would mean that God is a Bears fan if that were to happen, <laughs> of course, because uh, that's that's just all the stars aligning. And like you said, then I would definitely trade with the Vikings who now have two first-round picks and have farther to come up. It is, it's going to take those two first round picks if you guys really want your quarter, quarterback of the future for you guys. And uh, that's the ideal situation to occur, man, to, to have these teams uh, bidding against each other for that fourth quarterback uh, in the draft who's going to be J.J. McCarthy, which is likely possible, like you all have said. I think uh, the only other team I could see trading out of that position is the Giants, who you guys are saying that you feel – would draft uh, J.J. McCarthy. I can see them also trading out of the position, you know, and, and picking up some, some draft capital and allowing someone else to come up and get J.J. McCarthy and maybe drafting another quarterback later in the draft because uh, they're stuck with Daniel Jones this year and probably next year as well. So, Well, at least at least okay. for this year. After this year, they got to out. So, so to your point, Sam, I agree. So when you look at the next tier of quarterbacks, maybe they take a chance on a Spencer Rattler. See, yeah, that's who I was going with, Spencer Rattler, on a Spencer Rattler. Yep. I mean, the trade would good too for us outside of um, Are trading you guys division. Spencer in the first round, though? Is no, not in the first round. Okay. Just the Giants trading back and allowing someone else to come up with and get J.J. McCarthy and then they, them drafting a, a Spencer Rattler later in the draft, you know, because they're with stuck with you what you said, Swifty, and, and teams battling for, for you know, specifically Minnesota and Vegas battling us, if if Minnesota knows that Vegas is going to give us 12 and 45 or 13 and 44 or whatever it is right there in the middle of the second, and Minnesota says, okay, we'll give you 11, 23, and we want your third rounder back, can you imagine that? We have three first rounders. Nothing else the rest of the draft, but we have one, 11, and 23. Holy crap. That's the thing. Yeah, they don't have anything else – really to offer since they've moved up and have 11 and 23 now they don't they have a second away, round pick or a third they don't have a third so either yeah even to come up yeah. even to come up a couple spots like hey you're gonna have to give us that first and we'll give you a second back next year or a third maybe something <laughs> but yeah that's that's pos- and Walt, what, what were you saying man i'm sorry i think you got cut off there no no that's good um no i was just saying outside of trading in division we trade up to 11 minimum you know, we're still getting Jared Verse end of the day. The Jets aren't taking him, and they just took Will McDonald last year. So mm-hmm. yeah, it'd be a win-win. Win-win, man. If only. 
Yeah, y'all know me. I'm being the type. I'm being the type of verse. That's all I'm saying. Everybody say he's stiff in the hips, but look, we, I like that too. Yeah. Who's who's everyone's favorite defensive end in this little group here? I, I'm hardcore sold on Latu. I know I'm probably the only one that has him as my number one, but but I'm what first do you guys Turner, then Latu, then Chop. I, I love Latu. I got Latu verse Chop and then Turner. And the only reason I don't have Turner higher is I just don't like him in our four three. If we ran a three four, I'd have Turner higher. That's that's just me personally. But Latu uh, verse and then Chop for me. Yeah, I have Latu high, man. He's my he was my number one for a long time until I hear all the people talk about the injury, the neck injury, and you know how long he's going to be able to play and how degenerative, you know, injury type of injury or whatever, but. I think he's the best pass rusher in this draft, hands down. And then there's first, and then a Dallas Turner uh, for me, and then Chop Robinson. Yeah, I, I'm stuck at 1A, 1B with verse and Dallas Turner. I know, Adam, you're saying you think he fits better, you know, as an outside linebacker, but watching a lot of his stuff, especially out of his stance, he, he can do the job. And, and that's Yeah, you just don't see him put his hand down a lot. No, 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 you're right. He definitely doesn't. But then again, Will Anderson made the transition last year too for that same style of play. So I wouldn't yeah, put it past anyone coming out of Bama. Yeah, I yeah. think I'm pretty close with I'm um, pretty much what Walt said. It's I have verse at one. And I'd put Turner at two. I'd put Chop at three. And Liatu at four. I love Liatu Latu. He's the best pass rusher in the draft, but he doesn't have the long arms. He has the neck injury history, and he's not as stout um, setting the edge against the run. I just don't think he's the Eberflus Ryan Poles fit. But if they did take him, that would mean they, that they care more about the pass rush side. And I, I wouldn't argue it because mm -hmm. I thought he was the second best player at the Senior Bowl when I was down there other than JPJ. And he's mm -hmm. easily the best pass rusher. He can combo and chain his moves together and counter better than anyone in the draft easily. But it, it's the other things that I think I look at what does Flus and Eberflus look, or what does Eberflus and Poles look for? And they look for length, ability to set the edge, and that's that's not Liatu Latu. So I, I think when I'm looking at it for the Bears, I, I rank it that way based heavily on what would the Bears do. I mean, even with Latu, like you were saying, those medicals really scare me. I know a lot of people say, oh, it's just a neck fusion. Yeah, just the neck fusion, right? But I don't even think he makes my top four. Uh, number four has got to go to my boy Jonah Ellis out of Utah. I like Jonah Ellis. I, I just I, I wish that I wish the neck injury wasn't a concern. I actually hated that for uh, Latu when I was down at the Senior Bowl because he was one of the most popular guys there. So when you wanted to interview him, you had to wait around, right? And I'm waiting around, and I hear six to eight people all ask him the same question. Neck injury, neck injury, neck injury, neck injury. That's all they're asking them questions about it. How did you feel about it? Oh, when did you think you were going to play again? Um, do you does it still hurt? Does it still concern you? Is it going to be an, that's all teams were asking him? So I wanted to ask him about his what he wanted to show scouts, his pass rush ability, stuff like that. And I, I kind of felt bad for him. And I and he's played for two years now. So we're not doctors. I don't want to, I, I don't ever want a negative on the things like that, but we know Ryan Poles. We know how he is with injuries, and it's it's all those things combined. Even if the injuries check out fine, he still has the short arms, and he still isn't as good as the other guys at holding, is setting the edge and holding up against the run. So, and then also you look at RAS scores. Jared Verse stands out; he's up there with a nine point six something. I think Jared cool. Verse is just the perfect I'll edge for us. Aren't all four of those guys above nine point nine point five RAS scores? Um, Dallas Turner actually was down. His was like 8.8. .8. His first one was nine point something, but then someone actually corrected me from your video. They're like, how come Adam says he's eight something and you says he's nine? So I went and looked <laughs> and initially he was nine something, but it got updated because, uh, something was projected and he did it at his pro day and his actual RAS came back at like 8.89 .8 or something along those lines. Actually, I got it. I already Damn have it here. What's it say on there? Nope, I still have 9.49 on there. I didn't update that. Hold on. Let me Google it. <laughs> Listen, I mean, man. Layatu Latu is a special pass rusher, man. Short arms yeah. are not. I think the He's guy, moves too. he has the moves, man. And I think that's that's what's important. 
especially when you get into the next level, is the way you use your hands and the way you're able to string together uh, your move and your counters. I think he has that down packed better than anyone I've we've seen in the past probably five, ten years, man, uh, as far as a pass rusher goes. But the neck is concerning for everyone, I think, even us as fans and the, the entire league, uh, the GMs. But if I look at a guy like a Dallas Turner, man, he scares me. Everyone loves Dallas Turner, but that guy does not use his hands at all, man. He is a pure speed rusher. You know, he doesn't uh, – I don't see him – engaging with offensive linemen a lot, you know, and disengaging a lot. It's just – that kind of scares me about him, man, especially if you're asking him to put his hands in the dirt and pay a 4-3. I think an outside linebacker, he can get away with with just being, you know, that speed guy. But if he's in hard defense, that's not going to work out for us. So Leatu Le Latu and Jared Verse are the guys who I feel like will be able to play in our defense. But the best guy, like Will has said already, is uh Jared Verse. I think he's the most stout guy. He can set that edge uh in the run against the run. He can bend the corner. I don't think he's as stiff as everyone says he is. I think he was dealing with an injury the part of the year, and you know, he may have shown some stiffness at that point in time. But the dude is just a monster, man. He has really strong hands, man. A bull rush that speeds a power move, and you know, and I've seen him uh work his hands in, in counter moves and everything as well. So I think that's the guy, again, that I would target uh, if I were Ryan Pose, man. So hopefully we can trade back a little bit and still get a Jerry Burks, man. That's the idea. I'm, I'm going to defend my boy Leatu Latu here just for a minute. I don't see the issues with, with setting the edge as badly as you do, Swift, and I understand that's subjective, and we see it differently, and that's fine. Um, but let's look at arm length here. We got Dallas Turner with 34.375 arm length, and that is definitely long i mean he's got long arms and that's why a lot of people love him so much you get to the next three you've got jared verse arm length of 33.5 layatu latu 32.625 so less than an inch less and you got chop robinson with 32.5 which is less than layatu latus you get their missed tackles 24 percent for layatu latu jared verse 19.1 percent uh, Dallas Turner, the worst, 25. And then you got Chop Robinson with 7.1%, which is a ridiculously low missed tackle. So if you want someone who's set in the edge, you want someone who's not going to – I mean, defensive interiors are the ones who miss tackles at 7.1% because it's much easier to wrap up in the middle. At an edge missing tackles at 7.1% is ridiculously low. So all these guys have advantages, but I don't see those short arms – as short. I mean, it's less than an inch shorter than Jared versus Dallas Turner just has freakishly long arms for, I, for an end for anyone. I think the cutoff is usually it's the same with tackle. It's somewhere between that 33 and 33 and a half. And polls has shown he prefers over that with the defensive ends he's acquired. If you look at Montez Sweat and Dominique Robinson, Jared they have versus less arms. than an inch. Less than an inch longer, though. I mean, it's barely. Yeah, Jared, yeah I mean, well, Jared's is 33 and a half. I think that's right at the cutoff of about the shortest arms that people would go with when he's looking for length. You're looking for 33 and a half plus inch arms or 34 plus. And that's what Braxton Jones has that Montez Sweat, Dominique Robinson, the the outside guys he's acquired both on offense and defense, even Darnell Wright. Whereas Liatu Latu is a full inch shorter than Jared versus who's at the bare minimum that you want. So I think not that's, I, I think it could be, an, and <laughs> I don't think, I don't think it's, it's not something I judge, but when you listen and you go back and listen, <clears throat> and then you also look at what polls has done and what Eber flew every time Eber flues talks about a defender, even Jervon Dexter, usually you don't need length on the interior. That's why, the guys with short arms get moved to the interior, but he even wants the length on the interior guys like Javon Dexter. So I think, I think that, that that's just, I think it's a big deal for them. Yeah. Yeah, look Personally, how that worked out for Dominic Robinson. Yeah. He was a, he was a, he was a project though. I mean, that's a late yeah. fifth rounder guy yeah, who played wide receiver yeah, most of his career. Right. No, either one of those guys, look, either one of those guys opposite sweat. We, we saw what sweat did last year once he came. Like he he what got we got uh, Justin Jones paid in Arizona because prior 
to to Sweat getting there. Jones had zero sacks, and I think he ended up with what four or five sacks. Uh, Demarcus Walker, he slid inside, got like four sacks. I think uh, prior to Sweat getting there, Yannick had one sack, and I, before he broke his ankle, he had like four or five sacks. So I think with Sweat being that force multiplier and just freeing up <clears throat> those guys, it, whether it's Latu, Verge, Turner, uh, Chop, those guys that have a good I, – I can see a good rookie season, six to ten sacks. Uh, on the opposite side of, of Sweat, and then uh, Big Dex, I can see him getting about five, six, seven, eight sacks. I'm I'm really want to see the development, honestly, with Zach Pickens, because I thought he would have. I thought out of him and and, and Dex, he would have had a better year, but for whatever reason, his transition was a lot slower. So, you know, we I I don't want to see early on like we did last year, where the defense was getting just on on the pass. Because of lack of uh, pass rush, there there was there was really no there was, there was no pass rush. So come, I know Eric Washington said, "Look, it's going to be different," and that's another reason why I think we go defensive end with that second pick. Because when we look at it right now, who does Eric Washington have to work with to get pressure on the quarterback besides Sweat? I think that's a great point, and that kind of let's go back to what Adam was saying here. Is I don't want to. I didn't want to knock Liatu Latu. I think he's, like I said, the best pass rusher in this draft. And maybe that's what we're looking for. Because if you have, we have uh, Montez Sweat, we have Demarcus Walker, we have guys that can set the edge already. If we really want to, there's an argument you can make. If you want to take the defense to the next level, we need a guy that can get 10 plus sacks across for Montez Sweat. And if we're looking for that guy, Liatu Latu can definitely be that guy. And I'm I'm kind of with Adam. I think I think the arm length isn't as big of a deal. I just think it's I think the Bears might think it's a big deal. So I think they will prefer Jared Verse over him if it came down to it. Yeah, I Going mean, like what Adam, you're you saying with the uh, the arm length there. Personally, when you're talking a quarter inch, anything less than that, you're splitting hairs at this point. It doesn't matter. Um, the thing with Latu is though, he's got all the talent in the world, and that's not what stopped me from taking him. If I'm going to be a GM for a second, I have to look at longevity on the team. And yes, he's played for two years at UCLA and did great. But what's going to happen at the NFL? You do that fusion, all that area starts to stiffen up. And, you know, they have done some studies where usually NFL players go around five years after that, give or take. So you're looking at maybe three years and then you might foresee a problem down the road. I don't know if I can take that risk. And I'm willing to sacrifice the talent to go a more of a sure thing with, a, say, a Jared Verse than – with the possibility of, hey, I got a great player, but he's on the he's on the bench. You know, we're kind of running into that same thing with uh, Tevin Jenkins, great player, but unfortunately, he spends a yeah. lot of time sitting down. Yeah, don't even know if we we'll give him an extension yet because of how much he's hurt. We got to see how the season goes. Hmm. But if you if your if your doctors have evaluated him and they say, hey, we think he's going to be good for the next five to seven years, this is a guy who you, who's consistently going to get ten sacks a year, man. Easily, I think just because of the ta the talent is there, so I think you still draft that guy high, even if if it's five to seven years. I'm gonna take it. I'm taking it. That's fifty to seventy sacks that I'm gonna get out of this guy, guaranteed uh, for the next uh, five to seven years, man. And I think that's valuable. I think setting the edge, yeah, there's some value in setting the edge, but we have other guys who have the ability to do that and. Like Adam said, I don't think that he's uh, terrible at setting the edge. I think he's going to get stronger, so he'll be able to do that better, uh, maybe not this year, but next year. So uh, I think it's about getting sacks to me and getting pressure on the quarterback, and I don't think there's anyone in this draft that's better at doing that than Leiatu Latu. So I wouldn't pass on him strictly. If if it's three years, like Walt said, then, yeah, if, they, if people are – estimating like maybe in three years he's going to start having problems then yeah of course you know you have to reconsider it but five to seven years like man that's that's great to me like i'm, I'm taking them first round i'm trading back and i'm taking layout to lots i mean your so logic you is 100 percent sound go ahead go, go ahead Walt. no you go ahead oh. no i was just saying your logic is 100 percent sound samo i guess we have to look at it from ryan poles perspective is what is he willing to sacrifice and do those medicals really weight as high as we may or may not think they do 
you know, because like you said, he could very well go seven years, get 10 plus sacks a year. He could very well step on the field, take one hit, and he's done. That's the other way, yeah. He has a That's higher everything. probability of that happening than, say, uh, a Chop Robinson, Dallas Turner, Jared Verse. Yeah. So. Yeah. And hey, Will, with, have to consider. with what you said, Will, about the, the pass rush, um, <clears throat> I, I looked it up real quick. All of Jervon Dexter's sacks this last year came in the last five games, four sacks in the last five games. So the Montez sweat effect we were talking about, I think a lot of people are overlooking him. When they talk about us needing a three tech, I think Gervon is just coming on right now. He's coming on right in his prime right now. You saw Montez sweat talk about it on Chris Long's podcast on the green light podcast. He's super excited for him. I think all of us fans should be excited for him. He played, I shouldn't say better because there were other aspects that Jalen Carter was better at, but he played, at a Jalen Carter type of level, those last five games, he played just as well as the other top rookie at three tech. And I think he's in for some big things this year. He's going to be our starting three tech. And I think he's going to have that job all year long. I think he's going to put up more than four or five sacks. I think he could easily put up eight with Monta sweat right there. I think it's going to be a special year for Gervon. Gervon. Motivated, man. If you see him, if, if you don't follow yeah. any other player on Twitter, Follow uh, Jermon Dexter, man. That guy is and Brisker, alcoholic, man, and and Brisker. Oh, yeah, Brisker's funny too. And, and, Brisker is a great follow Tyson. because of his uh, his remarks. But if you want to see a guy work, which I like to see, guys who are trying to work on their perfecting their craft and working on their bodies, and Javon Dexter puts in the work. Him, uh, Demarcus Walker, those guys are impressive to me, man. They got right to work immediately after the season, man, and, and he's motivated to be a great one. So, and he has all of the traits, man, and it's just about the right coach getting it out of him. So I'm hoping that, you know, the Bears bringing in Eric Washington is going to really elevate his game and get him to that eight, nine sacks a game, man, excuse me, a season. And I think, that, like you said, Adam, he's, awesome. yeah, he's shown yeah. that he has that potential. Four games and four sacks and five games is not, nothing slight. So, Yeah, I mean, look yeah. what Eric, uh, Eric Washington did with Ed Oliver in Buffalo. He could do yep. the exact yeah. same thing with Javon Dexter here. I think it's going to be a big year for him. I, I love seeing all this stuff about the players motivated, and I'm not trying to start any controversy about quarterback one, but seeing what Tyson Bajan's doing this offseason too and his work he's putting in, I think he's put on like 20 pounds. Like yes, he, he looks does. stacked, man. Yes, he looks stacked. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I love seeing his these balls guys put in. And his balls got way more zip on them past 20 yards. They, they, they're yeah, not they medicine do. balls no more. I'm seeing some serious zip zip coming across on the intermediate and on, on that sail route. I'm seeing look, I'm seeing on time, it's not hanging in the air. So I'm look, I'm liking what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a lot of stuff about people talking about going to get Ryan Tanner here. Hey, stop the press. I, I don't see that. I'm like, look, let, hey, let like let, let Tyson go in there and start battling with a Hall of Fame game when we play the Houston um Texas, starting in. And then if we if we need to call uh, a t- Tannehill, because he's a veteran, he, he don't need much time to come in and get loose enough. Th- then you make that call. Look, go ahead and let Tyson get that that number two starting battle for that number one with with Kale. Even if you bring in the Tannehill, I think Tyson still remains your number two quarterback. That Tannehill is just a, an extra coach to me. Like I think that uh, before anything else, I think that uh, Tyson is a very intriguing player, man. If he gets his arm talent there, I think he has the the mindset, and I think he has the uh, the decision-making on the field. Like, man, I, I was impressed with that last year. I was impressed with him a lot last year, and uh, I'm loving to see him working this offseason just like any other player, man. Uh, that's what stands out to me. I've been watching – I've followed the Bears throughout the year, man. I've been doing this since I graduated college in 03. You know, I've always it, when the summertime starts, I'm trying to see who's working and I want to see when training camp starts, who looks different than they did the next year. You know, as far as their body size type looks and everything and, you know, who's looking like they're running faster and all those good things, man. Who put in the work? Because those are the players that are going to show up on Sundays. You know, that that work eventually pays off always. And. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing the Tyson Bajan and the Javon Dexter and the Demarcus Walker, you know, any a uh Swift, Swift. I don't know if you guys have been seeing Swift. Swift is uh working with yeah. some footwork specialists, man, and he looks extremely <laughs> motivated and extremely quick. Rosha Johnson too. 
Go Sean Johnson yeah. is also yeah, there. Yeah, work. I love these guys. They down here the speed camp down here in Dallas right now. Look, they, they look, look, and that's what I'm saying. Like I look at a Tom DeVito over there in New York. He had his, you know, little four game, of, but he flared out because he, he he let the hype get to him. You know what I'm saying? And we ain't seen no tape in the offseason, not that we follow the Giants, but we ain't seen no nothing surface where Tom DeVito was working. And we know uh Daniel Jones is coming back. <coughs> but bro, hey, but 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 Tyson, he out there in Cali getting it in, baby. Mm-hmm. Like I said, he yeah. don't put on 15, 20 pounds of muscle. He looked jacked. Like like the ball is jumping out of his hand. It ain't just flat passes no more. It ain't no 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 10 yard end cuts no more. Like he got he got zip when he throwing that sail route when he throwing when he throwing them, them them hitches when he throwing the fly route the ball is not hanging up like it did against Minnesota when he was throwing that that pass to to DJ Moore and it and it hung up there like a quail and got shut down and got picked off it's not doing that anymore so that lets me know that he's taking his craft serious and all these guys are bought in because they're working on their bodies they they they're increasing their intangibles. So, hey, guys, I think with this last play schedule, I don't care who's that quarterback, Tyson, Caleb, it don't matter. I think that if the defense is right, I think we can I, I, I think we can go 11, 6, 12, and 5. I mean, the, the thing with Tyson Bajan is even last year, you saw on his uh, Twitter page, he was you know, putting up all these videos of him training, and he definitely does a good job at doing that and in showing that image to the fans. My, my problem is a lot of these throws he's showing are just in vacuums. So I don't really put a lot of stock in that for any player. Tyson Bajan, Justin Fields, Caleb Williams, whomever. Uh, my problem with Tyson Bajan is what happened on the field last year. You know, he started sailing those passes that looked better when there was no one else around. Once you add in all the other elements of the game, then his decision-making went down. You know, I mean, you don't just throw six interceptions over four periods. It just doesn't happen unless you're making mental errors. I just didn't think that I think he trusted his arm too much, man. I think his arm is just not very strong. He can't get the velocity on the passes. I think if he had a Justin Field type arm, I think that he would have he would have had less interceptions last year. Mm-hmm. I think I, that, his arm was not very strong. That, that very well could change this year. You know, we could definitely see an yeah, increase in throwing power. You know, I mean, muscles don't even equate to that. So I'll, I'll wait to see. I'll wait to see it on the field. Me too, you and know? that's what I keep telling people. People keep saying, "Well, the arm could get stronger." I was like, "If the arm could get stronger in one year, then I would think that every pitcher in the in the in the uh, MPL would be throwing ninety mile fastballs." It, yeah. It's it's how small he was. I mean, he was coming from a real small school, tiny competition, and had never been in a real weight room. Like he definitely added muscle and bulk and that can definitely improve your strength it's not even all arm like just your base and your mechanics and your lower body can improve your arm strength so just being more built overall can make him give him he's not going to suddenly develop a cannon but he's always had a good arm he just hadn't been a huge arm because when i look at jordan love i remember last year everybody was laughing at jordan love compared to justin field but i'm like when you look at him in the the pocket (laughs) I'm like, hold up, hold up, man. He he ain't ripped up and cut up, but he got precision. He got precision on those passes, and he can hit them open spots. And he he be on his back foot throwing lollipops, and his wide receiver would go up and like Romeo Dow was going up making plays. I'm like, bro, where are these guys coming from? Like year in, year out, where Green Bay just keep restocking. Where well, I you can't get me talking about Jordan Love, brother. You can't you can't go there with me. I can't. I can't watch any more of those five-yard overthrows, four or five-yard underthrows, and give him credit for that. He improved a lot at the end of the year, but Jordan Love is not the reason for Green Bay's success, and I don't think he's accurate. It was Aaron all. Jones, if you ask me. Good coaching. His good coaching. Yeah, and, and no, it was coaching. Definitely the coaching. It was coaching, <laughs> but, but Aaron Jones was the catalyst for that. And that's why I think Green Bay going to struggle this year because well, I don't think Josh Jacobs is a good fit. For like Aaron Jones was a perfect not as good as Aaron Jones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he caught a lot of uh, the, the little arrow route. That's he killed <clears throat> TJ um, Edwards on that. The screen passes, I don't see that with Josh Jacobs. So if you take yeah. away that, and now you make Aaron, now you now you make Jordan Love really had to uh, play quarterback and go through his progression. 
This is where I think, even though Matt LaFleur is a great coach, I think Jordan Love is going to regress. And that's why I say I think we can take the North because we should sweep Minnesota. I'm going to say we're going to sweep Green Bay this year. I'm not going to say he's going to regress because I feel like they're going to hide what he's not good at. That's what the good coaching does. That's what Matt LaFleur did. He didn't ask him to do what he wasn't good at, man. And then mm-hmm. they also, if, if we follow the Green Bay Packers for the past 20, 30 years, man, they always seem to have good quarterbacks and great wide receivers, man. And that's just coaching, man, great development. They developed those receivers, man. Those guys weren't world beaters. Those guys were all pretty good college players, but not great college players, but they developed them into their system. So it seems like Green Bay already has a plan for guys that they draft. And that's what we haven't seen here with the Bears. You know, we're just drafting guys who had pretty good college careers and expecting them to come into onto our team and just have good college career, excuse me, pro careers without developing them. And that's right. why none of our wide receivers are pinned out because Bayless Jones has some good traits. Tyler Scott has some good traits, but we didn't have the good, the good coach to develop their talent and transition them into the NFL and, you know, allow them to do what they're good at early on and then, you know, build up on that. Like, we haven't seen that. We haven't seen that on the deep line either. So hopefully, you know, things have changed this year. Do you think Chris Beattie is that? Because that's one of the most exciting hires for me. I'm I'm very excited to have a wide receiver coach that I have some at least blind faith in that I'm excited to see what he – because we have been lacking there severely, even when we – when we draft wide receivers in the third round, Bayless Jones, or in the fourth round, Tyler Scott, those are those are not guarantees. Your your top wide receivers are going to come in the first and second round, but other teams, like you're saying, Green Bay, they're developing these guys, they're bringing them, and they're they're making them look like all stars. They're making them look way above caliber, and we haven't had that. And I I really that's one big area I want to see us hugely improve in. We need to have five six wide receivers that are good caliber, you know, not sub caliber because. We don't ever have that. We have one or two guys, and that's it every single year. And that's what kills us every year. We don't have depth, but that comes down to coaching too. Coaches create the depth, man. They coaching development, like and, and like I said, I, I like Tyke. You know, he's a good person. But at the end of the day, I'm looking at like you said, a, a Bo. What was Bo last name for the Packers? A, a, a Bo Melton. 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 Bo Melton. Yeah. Tavian Wicks. Like these. Jaden Reed had ten touchdowns. I'm like, bro, come like, because Christian Watson was hurt the whole year. Like, Romeo Dobbs, he balled in the two tight ends. Like, bro, it's like they have a a, a recycle for them where they could just plug and play. Then we looking at the, like, the Cowboys game. Bro, everybody was wide open. It was like, Oprah, you you get a call, you get a call, you get a call against the Packers. I mean, against the Cowboys, they were saying, you get a catch, you get a catch, you get a catch, you get a touch. You Like, it, like he was just throwing the ball to spaces. And the and the and the cornerbacks were like five, ten yards nowhere, even in the vicinity. And I'm yeah, like, I Jordan Love was under throwing those. Yeah, you're right. You're right. A lot of and, them he, and they would come back and have all this space to come back and make all those yes. catches for Jordan. They they made him look so good where he could catch up. And at the end of the year, he was playing better. But it was all of that scheme fit, all this coaching, and all that. I mean, they were open 15 yards where he was under throwing them five yards, over throwing them five yards. And I was like, he's so terrible, and that they're still killing us because of that coaching and because of the scheme fits they have. I am jealous. I'm jealous of Packers, and I hope we're getting there because all these changes we're making should bring the Bears there, and it should turn this around because I'm sick of freaking losing so freaking much to the Packers. I have other words I want to say, but I'm going to get these. Yeah. Hey, guys, I don't want to interrupt really quick, but uh, I do have to step off. So uh, I just want to let you guys know thanks for having me on. You know, It was a pleasure. I hope we can do this again sometime and enjoy the rest of your evening. We love you, Walt. Thanks for coming on, man. All right, Walt. Well, appreciate you. See you, guys. Enjoy dinner, man. Hey, it was good to hear. Was it not really, really good to hear Montez Sweat go on that Chris Long podcast and say he is not losing to the Packers this year? He was like, he wants Ooh. to beat them so badly. And that's the type yeah. of leadership we need. Our leadership. He said, I can't do it. He said, I can't do it. He's like, I cannot lose to them this year. He's, so he wants to beat those guys twice this year. So he's feeling it. And I'm hoping that, you know, his leadership and the other leaders on the team, you know, make these young guys feel it like this rivalry has to now become a real rivalry because it's been so one sided for so long, man. And I don't think the young guys really cared about it. So it's good to hear 
a new guy come in and one year who played one game with the against them uh, with us and automatically yeah. feel like you know what this has to end. So last yeah, he's game, good. we are 14 and 46 against the back. I know. Stop. Don't don't bring it up. Man. Like 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 it, the tide has to change. We 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 should be in the season now for the next 10 years where it, it becomes the pendulum starts to shift in the other direction. Because I'm telling you, last year, that first game of the year, man, we were so, so pumped much up after it was hype. Like yeah. and then we were ready to just get demolished. Like, nah, we got to, like, we got, because see, if, if we come out and lay an egg against the Packers, all of this is for not. All the game planning, all the strategic game planning, like, all of this is for not. Because to me, once you get over that psychological hurdle of beat, because we own the Detroit Lions, I'm not worried about the Lions. I'm not worried about the uh, the Pack, I mean, the, uh, the Vikings. Once, once you overcome that psychological block with the Packers, Everything else, I'm telling y'all, is gonna be easy peasy. But it starts it stars in tinsel time, guys. And, and and now is the time. So it's like, look, I think we're gonna have a good drive. We still got some more vets we're gonna add, probably on some one-year deals. And I see, like I said, I see another trade coming. So hey guys, like I said, get get ready. I think this is gonna be a good year. Yeah, hundred percent, guys. I think I think that about wraps it up. I was gonna comment about the locker room, but you guys kind of already nailed it. I think I think we've kind of already fixed the culture in the locker room. I think it's Brisker and these new guys, Montez Sweat and all these guys. They they're a new era. This isn't the same old Bears. We're we're not. Hopefully, we can beat the Packers. That's what's next. Uh, do you guys have any final thoughts? Anything else you want to add? No, I like where we're heading at the end there. I think there's some clear leaders that will take that uh, and step forward. Montez Sweat uh, is clearly that on the defense. I love what the Bears did with Caleb Williams. Everyone knows I want Caleb Williams to prove it before I'm the diehard fan. But I love that they had him meet with multiple players, and specifically that DJ Moore was there for his top 30 because DJ Moore was the one that was open saying – he ain't better. And he wasn't being specific. I mean, he was just trying to defend Justin Fields, but he said he they ain't better. Talking about all three of the quarterbacks coming out, they ain't better than Justin Fields. But they had DJ Moore there, and that helps the culture of this team. And having the first overall pick gives us that advantage that we can have him start incorporating earlier. We can even have him sign a contract right now. Like a lot of fans don't realize that yet. We won't because there's no advantage to doing it. I mean, if anything crazy happened between now and the draft, you don't want to have that. But but we have the advantage of getting him incorporated, getting him involved with the team. And I love that the Bears are doing that, that they're having him meet with older players, that Keenan Allen was there on his pro day, that they're getting him incorporated because that brings down that adjustment time that gets him incorporated. And the locker room is all going to be all, all in and that everyone's going to be headed in the right direction. So I love it. I, I really appreciate you guys having me on and being here. It was a lot of fun to, to yuck it up and chop with you guys. It always is. I love just talking Bears football. That's I just love it. So thanks for having me on, guys. I definitely Adam, agree. it was a blast, brother. You're going to be a mainstay. You know that. Yep. I absolutely agree Thank with you, Adam, man. And salute to you for coming on, man. I love chopping it up with you. Uh, I love seeing what the Bears did with, with Caleb Williams and how they're bringing them in, dog. And I just hope that, you know, Caleb is everything that everyone thinks that he is. You know, the Bears, it's our time now. It's just our time, you know. Seems like things are falling right into place, and, and it's in Ryan Pace's, excuse me, Ryan Pose's vision. So I think we just have to trust that right now and believe in him and whatever he decides to do at nine, you know, I'm, I'm going to ride with it. If he takes a player, I'm riding with it. If he trades back, I'm riding with it, man, because I believe in what he's done so far these, in these last two years. I think we had an opportunity to make the playoffs last year with uh, a roster that wasn't very strong. So imagine what he's going to do with uh, uh, Caleb Williams and, you know, a few more additional pieces that he's added this offseason. I couldn't have said it better myself. Appreciate you guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us, Adam. Anybody who doesn't know, um, Adam, it's at Bear Down Sports, right? Yeah. Okay. Just type at Bear Down Adam Mason. You'll find it either way. Yep. Or type in Adam Mason. You can find him. 
And Samo's a part of the MODG squad, so you can find him right here. It's right here. You got a sub, though. And hit that like button, guys. And uh, bear down. That's all I got to say. I'm I'm out, you guys. Bear down, all. Squad up. Bear down. Squad up. Bear down. Mod squad, baby. Mod squad.